Uh, I'm going to sit with you this morning. <coughs> if we had a six-inch platform or eight, it would be quite a bit better, but I think we can manage. Uh, in case some of you have a little difficulty, maybe you like to spread out a little bit, I would like to be seen as well as heard, if you understand. Uh, it works better for me this way, at least normally. <coughs> I last longer. And uh, helps some relaxation all around. I don't like to, you know, be foremost, death, rich, and what have you. So uh, if you just want to spread a little bit, there are some nice holes <laughs> here. That looks quite good. Some choice seats over here. All right, now, <coughs> uh, last evening I gave you somewhat of a, an introduction by way of experience, as you remember if you were here. Uh, actually, I hadn't planned it quite that way, but uh, that's the way it worked out, and I feel that we were at the right track. Now, this morning, we're going to look into the Word, <coughs> and uh, we're going to turn to the book of Exodus, chapter 33, <coughs> and there we'll take verses 12, 12 to 15. <coughs> uh, this is a passage that always thrills me, stirs my heart. And Moses said unto the Lord, See, thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. And he said unto him, that is, Moses to God, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. I'm going to add 16. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not in that thou goest with us, so shall we be separated? I and thy people from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Now in this last verse, what Moses is saying, so shall we be distinguished. The idea being that the distinguishing mark between God's people and the other nations was to be the presence of God. And today, the presence of God shall distinguish the people of God from all other people. Now then, notice that Moses here began to pray. He had a great sense of need. He had a long journey ahead of him, the road would be dangerous, difficult, and worst of all, 
He had a very difficult people to lead. They were stubborn, self-willed, disobedient. Moses knew his people, and he dreaded to lead them into the promised land. So he prayed and said, Show me now thy way that I may know thee. Now, I'm not saying much about the ways of the Lord. That is a, a series of studies all by itself. Except I make this remark. Very often we learn to know God through his ways. What he does, how he does it, how he works. As we watch God at work, we learn something about his character, his nature. And Moses recognized that. I wish we could pursue that now, but uh, we do not have that time. Show me now thy way. Now God's ways differ from ours that I may know thee. Uh, some of you, I suppose, have known or do know Hattie Hammond. Well, she and I had a series of meetings in Washington together, and they put us up at the Ambassador Hotel. So after the night service, we got together in the coffee shop or what have you, and had some snacks and talked. And she'd say, Brother Butler, what do you know? Well, Miss Hammond, what do you know? <laughs> and she told me something there that I'll never forget. She was in, in uh, Springfield, Missouri. That's the headquarters of the Assemblies of God. They had a huge convention. And the young fellow spoke. There were thousands of people there. She sat on the platform as a matter of courtesy. And she said, Brother Butler, you never heard a worse harangue than that young feller uh, harangued the people. He tore up, she said, the A.G. up and down, left and right. She said it was awful. And when he got done, the power of God fell. The people stood worshiping the Lord. The Lord poured out his spirit. And she said, I was dumbfounded. And said to the Lord, Lord, tell me something. How can you bless a harangue like we have had this time? And she said, Brother Butler, what you think the Lord said? Well, tell me. <laughs> And the Lord said, I am not blessing one word of all that he said. I'm pouring the spirit of rejoicing upon my people to help them forget everything he did say. <laughs> <laughs> the next time I congratulate myself <laughs> for the Lord's blessing after I spoke. Maybe <laughs> he uses his eraser. <laughs> well, you know, those things teach me something about God. You watch God at work. Well, I can't indulge him. Show me now thy way that I may know thee. Now, I'm going to talk to you a bit this morning about the personal knowledge of a personal God and then gradually lead up to and into the manifestations of his presence. I think we'll get into that by the end of this morning, and I think that this evening I'm going to deal specifically with the diversity of the manifestations of the presence of God, as far as I can foresee. All right, now, here is this cry of Moses that I may know thee. First of all, recognize that Moses is not speaking about an intellectual knowledge of God. 
Now, we need the intellect. We need to know, of course. We need to be informed adequately, well informed. But in this study that we are having, we are not speaking about being so much informed about God, although this is information but a different kind, but rather we are speaking of a personal acquaintance with a personal God in personal experience. Now with Nixon, President Nixon comes on the screen, I know who he is, I may recognize him in a crowd, I don't know him. I may know about him, but I do not know him, had no acquaintance. My older daughter Myra had a hobby when she was a little girl. She loved to learn all about Queen Elizabeth. She had books, I would say they stacked perhaps this high. She could tell you so many things about the Queen, all kinds of information. Well, one day the French assemblies had asked me whether I wouldn't like to bring some of my family along, so I took Myra that year, and they paid for her fare. And uh, I said, Myra, you're so fond of the Queen, let's stop in London on our way to Paris. So we did, and I took her out, of course, to Buckingham Palace. Some of you, of course, know what I'm talking about. You've been there. Well, we were there at the gate, watched the guards up and down, and she said, Daddy, you think we'll see the Queen? Well, I said, it's very, very unlikely. And that girl was so disappointed. She had a stack of books about the Queen this high, could tell you about her horses, her, her way of living, her responsibilities, and whatever, her personality. And when we turned, she said, Daddy, you know, I still don't know the Queen. Well, the reason was she didn't even open the window, though she was there, you can tell from the flag. She didn't say, well, Brother Buter, Myra, come on in for a cup of tea, have a chat. <laughs> she didn't, so we had no opportunity because of the lack of a uh, relationship, of an acquaintance, we didn't get to know her. Well, God wants us to know in experience. Now, this Moses amazes me. Notice in 33, same book, 11, the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Now, here is a man so intimate with God, this is a matter of intimacy, that it says God spoke with him face to face, that is to say, directly, not in a roundabout way, through a vision, through a dream, by sending another prophet, no. He talked to him personally, and yet, even though this man had a personal acquaintance with God already. He still prayed, show me now thy way that I may know thee. In other words, the man wanted to know God even more. I was speaking in our school where I'm teaching, you know, uh, one morning to the students on seeking God. And the teacher kind of challenged me. He said, Brother Butler, why do you teach these students, exhort them to seek God when they have already found him? My answer was, because they need to find him some more. <laughs> there is no limit in the disclosure of God to our hearts. Yeah. And even though this Moses had communion with God according to God's own word, face to face, the man still wanted to know more of God. Show me now thy way that I may know thee. 
And in Deuteronomy, we have a similar statement bearing down on the same truth, but adding a bit to it. The last chapter, verse 10, that would be chapter 30, uh, chapter 32, oh, I thought it was 34, it is, chapter 34, 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, between those two, Moses and God, there was an intimate relationship and an intimate communion, and yet the man prayed that I may know thee. Furthermore, that man Moses had an intimate privilege. Now, there are three things here. Intimate communion, Exodus 33, 11. An intimate relationship, Ex Deuteronomy 34, 10. And an intimate privilege, Numbers 12, 8. I repeated that because I see that some of you are making notes, so I thought I'll bear that in mind. Be specific, gives you a chance to put things down. Now, uh, coming to the intimate privilege, that's in, in Numbers 12, 8. I'm avoiding some of the context uh, to save time because we have a long ways to go. And I'd like to give you all that I possibly can. With him, not a him here, is Moses. God is speaking. Numbers 12, 8. With him will I speak mouth to mouth. Now that simply means directly without a using any uh, indirect means of communication. With him will I speak mouth to mouth even apparently and not in dark speeches uh, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Wherefore then were ye not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Incidentally, God is very sensitive as to how we talk about those who are personal friends of God. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my personal friend Moses? That's the implication. But now specifically the privilege. And the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. Now in my studying, I love to use different translations. To me, they are may I say, delicious, that's a butlerism, delicious. You have to get used to butler, uh, but uh, I'll take a little time. Uh, these different translations to me are, are remarkable. Now, some are quite modernistic, some have to be watched, some you have to use reservations with. But they, they throw different rays of light. Uh, some of you might have been at the Tower of London and saw there, without doubt, the, uh, the uh, chamber, the tower where they keep all the jewels and so forth of the kings and queens of England. Well, there is a diamond there. And I would say, I haven't been there for some years, I would say this diamond is, I would say, about this size, somewhat in the form of a heart. It's a deceptive. I like to watch it. You look at it one way, now you see yellow sparkle. You change a little bit, now it's green. Look at it from another angle, now you see red or blue. All right, you have different colors reflected in that diamond. 
but it is all the same diamond. And so to me, these translations are like a diamond. One translator emphasizes one color of truth, or brings it out, another, 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 but they're all the same diamond, making allowance and exceptions for modernism that does get into some of our translations. That is something else. Now, different translators use here a different term. We have in our authorized version the term similitude. All right, now then, other translations read such as, and the form of the Lord shall he behold. Another reads, and the shape of the Lord shall he behold. Another reads, and the likeness of the Lord shall he behold. So you have similitude, you have likeness, you have shape, you have form. Now I'll get to this area, I don't know when, maybe this evening, not sure enough, maybe this morning yet. But just let me say this, even though God is a spirit, and we'll get into that, and does not have a material body. As far as I am concerned, God has a form. And I'll tell you why uh, at a little later. For now we just say that God has given Moses the privilege to behold the similitude, the likeness, the shape, the form, of God. So we have here in this man intimate communion, an intimate relationship, and an intimate privilege. For the form, we need a little more time at a better place. Now, for this knowledge of God, now I'm speaking of the personal acquaintance. We are not far from Washington. I don't think Nixon will ask me up for lunch and say, Brother Buehler, let's get acquainted. I don't think so. <laughs> you wonder. <laughs> oh, that's never mind. Now, let's see what God thinks of this knowledge. I think you thought I meant that really. The way you look so serious, folks, as I have a sense of humor, and that's my salvation. <laughs> you took me too serious. Well, you don't know me. Ask why she knows. And yet she said already, I've lived with you for so long, and I still don't know you. Strange character. I have a sense of humor. I need that. It's my salvation. Now, I have another salvation, but I need, I need this. I couldn't take things in the right. Do you remember, perhaps, in John 17, 3, Jesus prayed that they might know thee. So Jesus was interested in the personal knowledge of God on part of his disciples. He wanted his disciples to know God. And between thee and me, I would say that that is really the keynote of this retreat that we are having this weekend, that they might know thee, and you are the they. Then in Hosea 6.6, 6, God makes a comparison, or shall we say an evaluation. Hosea 6.6, 6, For I desired mercy, and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God, more than burnt offerings. God was more interested in the days of Israel 
that they might know God, then he was in all their gifts and in all their point offerings. God is desirous that we should know him. And that, of course, will involve the knowledge of his personal presence. In Jeremiah 24, 7, we have a pertinent statement. <clears throat> I will give them an heart to know me. Friends, in the final analysis, God is not known by the intellect, by the intellect, we are informed about God, and that is absolutely essential, of course. What can you do without information? But this true knowledge or this real knowledge of God is a matter of the heart. God said, I will give them a heart. Oh, that involves an inner capacity, an inner capability to enter into a personal relationship with God. I pray this many times, O oh God, give me an heart to know thee. And as we sit together, I am directing my words through your intellect to your heart. If I don't get down to the heart, I haven't accomplished much. I think I do. But that's where I'm working. I'm working in the heart. So we have to use the mind as a channel, but the heart is the field of my operation. So this is a prayer for all of us. Oh, Lord, give us a heart, the capacity, the capability to know you in personal experience and believe you me. God is interested in that. Then uh, Jeremiah 9.23, here we'll have to pause a little bit longer. I'm watching the time at the same time so I can attempt to cover the most needful things in this, in this area since we don't have a whole week. Uh, Jeremiah 9 beginning with 23. Uh, I, I, I like this. Oh, I like it all. You know why I like it all? I like the Lord. You know the Lord's all right. I think God is top. I, I really do. He's okay. No, I, I mean it. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, in his education, in his degrees, in his achievements, all right, of course, but it's not the reason for glory. <clears throat> Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. The man of authority, the man who says go and he goeth, the man who can give orders and people better comply. No, no, that's no cause for rejoicing. Appreciation perhaps, but not this. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. <coughs> Let not the man that has ever so much money in the bank glory that that's what he's got. Let not the millionaire glory in his millions. Let not the man with a beautiful home, waterfall carpeting, hundred thousand dollar mansion glory in what he has. That's something to rejoice about, to thank God for, but the glory about it, the Lord says, don't do it. But let him that glory, glory in this. Now, what Jeremiah is talking about is not vainglorious conduct. He's talking about a sincere rejoicing an appreciative exclamation of what? That he understandeth and knoweth me. Notice two things. God 
can be understood. Now, he cannot be understood in the nth degree. God is infinite, we are finite. But many, many of his ways, God wants to be understood. You remember a statement in Deuteronomy 29, 29. I may not quote it absolutely correctly, but nearly enough. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children. I think I have it correct. Now here are two huge areas of truth. Things which are secret. There are secrets about God which he keeps to himself. There are other secrets which he reveals. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. For instance, take the Trinity. God has not revealed the Trinity, only the fact of the Trinity indirectly. But he has never revealed how God can be three persons and one at the same time. We can try, get illustrations, but none is satisfactory. Uh, God has existed from everlasting. God has revealed we can comprehend that we're finite. Now, <clears throat> I don't have a blackboard here, and it's not necessary. But you remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God said, of all these trees ye may freely eat. But there was one tree, not necessarily an apple tree. We say it's an apple, but nobody really knows. I'd make it a mango. <laughs> 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 but mango or apple or prune or what? It was a tree with fruit. And God said, but of this tree he shall not eat. Now God did something there. Of all these trees ye may freely eat. Uh, may I say something that could be controversial, but we won't controverse. <laughs> In theology particularly, we speak of man being a free moral agent, able to do as he wills. I cannot buy that bit of theology. Man, I have a reason for saying it now because I'm not going to get into theological disputes. Oh, please don't take me out. I cannot buy the theory of the absolute freedom of man for the simple reason of all these things ye may freely eat but I say the freedom of man as a free moral agent was circumscribed there was a limit to it he was not absolutely free he was under duress all right, you may go outside the circle of my will. You may, you can do it if you want to. But if you do, such and such a thing is going to happen. Therefore, personally, I, I don't make an issue of it. I would say man's freedom was relative rather than absolute. Adam and Eve were under duress. If they went beyond, they got into trouble. And God has put a limit to our knowledge of good. And folks, now folks is a beautifulism. If we, with our intellectual, carnal curiosity, seek to go beyond the circle of the divine revelation, seeking to press into things which God has not revealed, I say we're getting into trouble. And if we pursue that, 
for instance, the origin of sin. All right, we trace it back to Satan. Very well, there was pride in his heart. Granted, where did this pride come from? How, how come God made it possible? What originated that pride? God must have given consent that pride could develop in Satan's heart. All right. If you press that kind of rational to the nth degree, you will find that before you're aware of it, a question gets raised concerning the integrity and holiness of God, and before long you have God on the judgment seat, you have God as the defendant, and you're the prosecutor, and beyond that lies the rejection of God and infidelity, and the whole thing breaks down because we are pressing beyond the limits of what belongs unto us. And that's where many a theologian has met his Waterloo. In his carnal curiosity, seeking to press beyond the limits of the divine restraint. You have something like that in Colossians. Vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, trying to intrude into the things that God has kept from man. That will lead to disaster. Now we're coming back. Of all these trees, ye may freely eat. I want to give you a little practical lesson here, just in passing. Uh, I was a pastor. <coughs> Visited a lady, rang the bell, kept ringing, ringing. I knew she always was home. She couldn't go out. Rang, 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 rang. Finally she came. She said, Brother Butler, excuse me, it took me a long time to find the will of God as to whether I should open the door for you. <laughs> she said, you know, Brother Butler, I believe in being spiritual, and I don't do anything without asking the Lord. I ask him what I should wear, I ask him what I should eat, I ask him about all my personal affairs, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> And I thought I looked at a candidate that was ready for a certain institution. You still don't get me. I thought she needed a psychiatrist badly. I believe in the will of God. I've had wonderful evenings, but friends, God has also given us an intellect and common sense. The only trouble with common sense is that it's becoming such an uncommon thing. <laughs> and you need look no farther than Washington. But some senseless things come out of that place is beyond belief. God is giving us latitude. I don't have to ask God what tie I should wear. I look at the weather, I said to wife this morning, I don't know what to wear. We came prepared for cold and for hot because you have both around. Well, I don't say, oh dear Lord, no. what shall I wear today? What temperature is it going to be? No. There are many things in the area of our ordinary life where God has given us the sense to simply make our own choice. But there is a, a limit. And here God provided this limitation. That was in, in person. Now, touching again on uh, Jeremiah, that he understandeth and knoweth me. <coughs> Two things now. God can be understood within the sphere of what belongs to us. You understand? Not in the in the other sphere. God has kept that to himself. And you know what? I have learned to respect the silence of God. And when God does not want to explain, we ought to have enough respect to be content. I was riding in a car with some ladies. One asked me a question. I forgot the question, but I remember her. 
she had no business asking, so I didn't answer. Uh, Brother Butler, perhaps you didn't hear, I asked you, and I didn't answer. He said, Brother Butler, don't I get an answer from you? I said, Sister, you shouldn't ask that question. I had hoped she had enough respect for my silence, but some people don't have enough sense, need the respect. <laughs> We are, not, uh, we are not obligated to say everything people want to know, and so we do. God keeps some things to himself, and we ought to learn to respect his silence. And that has to do also with the area of truth. That he understandeth and knoweth me. Two things we are asked here to glory about. Now, this is humble, uh, grateful appreciation. I came home from South America one year, and, well, usually I like to bring something. Generally do. But that year, I didn't bring anything. I had a little girl, Norma. I was in the kitchen, had just come up from the south, and I said, Norma, I'm so sorry, but this time I couldn't bring you anything. I forgot the reason for it. And she climbed up on my lap, put her little arm around my neck, and said, Daddy, that's all right, don't you worry. You are my best present. You are the nicest daddy I ever had. <laughs> well, I knew that. <laughs> no doubt about it. But when she said that, I felt like going to Philadelphia and buy up the Wanamaker store and, and hand it to her. Do you know what I mean? Right. Now, she was glorying. You're the best daddy I ever had. That little arm was around that neck. You know those things are worth millions. Well, God wants us to glory about him. Not forth, but in simplicity, in humility, in gratefulness. And God seems to believe what has often been said, joys not shared are only have enjoyed. God loves to enter in our joys, into our joys, and when we glory in the right way about him, God's heart itself, he has feelings too, he has emotions, he has an emotional nature, he has a social nature, he too rejoices, and both are satisfied. For it says here, in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Uh, I was in a meeting many years back, attending a Bible study, and the uh, pastor was teaching. At the end, we stood, and he said to me, uh, Brother Butler, will you close in prayer, please? Well, I was so filled up with the spirit of rejoicing, I just got to shouting. I couldn't dismiss, I couldn't pray. I simply, hallelujah, do you know what that is? I see you're good at it yourself. <laughs> and the things, the things spread right over this Bible study, two, three dozen people, something like that. And there we were, hallelujah, praise God. Well, he asked me to dismiss, but uh, I couldn't dismiss. However, that's all right to do. Things subsided. We had a message in tongues, and he interpreted. This was part of the interpretation. In fact, this was the interpretation. Uh, let me get straight. God is pouring out his spirit of rejoicing upon his people because a sinner has repented. And there is so much joy in heaven that God wants to share the joys of heaven with his people so that he and they may rejoice together. To me, that's delicious. <laughs> so that is one of the reasons why sometimes the spirit of rejoicing comes on God's people and you just stand there, hallelujah, praise the Lord. It just came, well... Can be again that God lets his people share. share. Joys, not share, are only half enjoyed.
A short time before I left, I read the Philadelphia Inquirer. Airlines opening up tourist class to Europe via the Azores. Same fare, doesn't cost it. Oh, I thought, now look at that. How often I wanted to stop at the Azores, and now I couldn't. And yet I said, well, I know I'm in the will of God with the route that I have chosen. But, oh, I thought, here is my opportunity, and yes. So I went to my superintendent. I have a superintendent up there. I made him my superintendent in Central Bible Institute in 1931. I'll tell you how. I was alone in the world, had no home, my folk were in Germany. Before graduation, a feller walked in, the son of a superintendent of big healthy hospital. Walter, what are you going to do after graduation? I don't know. Are you going back east? I don't know. Will you go west? I don't know. You think you'll be an evangelist? I don't know. He said, man, what do you know? <laughs> and I said, well, I guess I don't know anything. <laughs> and he stood there straight enough. And I'll never forget this. Now, you'll learn something from this. I'm not just telling things. I have my reason. He stood there. Boy, he said, I'm glad I'm not like you. I still see that hand of disdain belittling. I'm glad I'm not like you. He said, my father is the superintendent of the Kansas district. He was. And he's the personal friend of the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Springfield. Oh, he says, when I graduate, my father is going to give me a church, and I'll get a big one. I don't have to start at the bottom like you fellas. I start at the top. Boy, am I glad. And he went like this, went through that door, and shut the door with a bang. And that thing was just like a shot into my heart. It really hurt. I was alone. It stung to the quick. Took the stung, the sting for a few moments, and I felt my heart sink. Where will I go? What will I do? I don't even have a place to ship my trunk to, and they told us to get out. Nobody can stay in school. But where to? That was my hard luck. I dropped down at my cot. I know these things are there, but I can't let them bind me up. I dropped down at my cot. And this is what I did. I said, Father, did you hear what he said? <laughs> <laughs> I pray different from people. I don't make theological and ecclesiastical prayers. He's <laughs> <laughs> my father. I don't have to come to work, but I need my dad. Why Roman says, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That means Papa. <laughs> In New Guinea, they know how to pray. Their skin scaly from lack of protein. Dressed very little, to be sure. Have a very poor English. They call it uh, oh, pigeon English, something like that. And they pray, Oh, Papa God, you nice fellow upstairs. <laughs> Me no am any good. But you, nice Papa God, I get a thrill out <laughs> I love that. That's the percent of Oh, and so hold on. 
All right, here was my son. And at once, in one moment, in a flash of revelation, it came just like this, but I have to put it in words. I do not know if you can understand this, but believe it anyway. I have to put it in words because I cannot reveal to you something so fully in such a moment the way God can. That's the spirit, the we of the earth. It is true that his father is a superintendent. That was in the Revelation. It is furthermore true that his father is the personal friend of the general superintendent. But it is also true that I am your father and that I am the superintendent of all superintendents, <laughs> including the general superintendent of Springfield. And I am your personal superintendent. I lifted up my hands, I said, Father, this day I acknowledge you as my personal superintendent. And he has been a good one. <laughs> but this fellow, would you like know what happened to him? I was down in Rio de Janeiro and told this to the national workers. I usually have seminars the uh, world over with these pastors. And we got home to the missionary's house. He said, say, Butler, did you ever find out what happened to that fellow? I remember him. I said, no, I, I often wondered. He said, he became a butcher. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, his father was going to give him a picture. He became a butcher. He's a butcher today. Friends, the race is not to the swim. The battle is not to the strong. Now we'll go back to the Azores. Could you follow me in this roundabout way? Father, I said, look, did you perchance read the Philadelphia Inquirer? <laughs> That's how I pray. And don't bother me now with your theology. And say, well, <laughs> God does not have to read the inquiry. God knows all things. I know that. I know that. I know it very well. But I also know that coming this way to God works. <laughs> There's an intimacy there. A relationship there, so I pray. Father, did you perchance read the Philadelphia Inquirer? And if you did, did you no notice the notice they had there about the, the, uh, the Azores being open for tourist travel? I said, Father, I had wanted to go that way for so long, and now I'm going to the other way. I, I just wonder about this. And he gave me such a witness, not in words, simply a witness, as though we were saying, and this is way of saying it, well, if you'd like to change, no objection. And I got such a something, I knew it was all right for me to change if I wanted to. I changed. Now, the Azores is nothing. But I got that curiosity satisfied. That is to say, we only made a plane stop. What can you do there? When I got back to school in the fall, I told the class, because I was, as my little girl used to say, all giggled up. I thought God was so nice, so considerate in letting me change. It's amazing what God will do for you. You treat him right. He'll treat you right. You respect his wishes. He will respect yours. So I told the students how nice the Lord was in letting me change after I knew I was going in his will. But he came around. No sooner had I finished when one of the girls gave an utterance in tongues. One of the fellows interpreted something like this. God is pleased when he sees that he can please his children. For God loves to please his children and rejoices in their pleasure. 
So, joy is not shared. Our only have enjoyed. When God saw that I was happy, then he was happy. It's almost like parents. You do something for your children. Oh, mommy, that is beautiful. Oh, you are just so nice. Oh, I'm so glad. Doesn't that make you happy? And so we enter into a mutual joy with him. So, uh, let him... The glory of glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness. Oh, God is so nice. I, I, I just love to boast about the Lord. You know, I was in Africa, or going to Africa, and I had my root, looked at my root, and just happened to see Thebes, you know, up the river, uh, Nile. Oh, I had, would have liked to stop there many times to look at the ancient ruins of Thebes, the Temple of Karnak and what have you, these famed columns. But I knew that I had nothing to do there. And as I looked at that on my map, I got a witness. And the Lord witnessed to me, you may stop, be all right. So I went up the Nile and stopped there. And to me, it was a thrill to see the, the, uh, the, um, the uh, fulfillment of, of prophecy, this vast plain where that huge uh, city used to stand so powerful, so beautiful, a vast plain, nothing left. Uh, over on the other side, there's, that's different. Nothing but two columns and way back in the hills of the old palace of the queen. Vast plain. I came home, said to one of the teachers, he said, what did you see in Thebes? Well, I said, I'll tell you. There was really nothing left on the west side of the Nile where the main part of the city stood. Well, he said, I knew that you wouldn't see anything there. I saw a lot. What do you mean seeing a lot? A vast plain with two inch in columns standing right in the middle? I saw a lot. People look at it. Huh. There's nothing left. What do you see? Ooh, I see a lot. What do I see? I know that here was this huge city with a hundred gates. One of the seven wonders of the world. God had said, I'm going to wipe no of the map, in so many words. And what I saw was that tremendous power of Almighty God, the veracity of his word of prophecy, that he could obliterate such a huge city. I saw the might of God in an empty plain. It depends on how you look at things. See what I mean? So these are all a part, among many others, of the kindness, the goodness of the Lord. I closed my book, but I'm not finished. Let's see what we have. I want to shift gears here. Say, maybe it would be well to stand and sing a chorus. I think that people need to be rested a little bit. Could you lead us in something, brother? I think that might be. Oh, how I love
want to speak a little bit on the attainment of this knowledge of God, and then that will lead us closer to the angle of the manifest presence. Uh, Matthew 11, 25 to 26, uh, we'll need at this uh, juncture <coughs> what did I give you there 25 to 26 yeah that is correct at that time Jesus answered and said I thank thee O Father Lord of heaven and earth because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Do you notice something? God deliberately withholds some truths from some people. By the way, how late can we go here? 12 o'clock would be all right. God deliberately withholds some truths from some people. As thou saying, no, I won't give you that. <laughs> no. Now from whom would God withhold truth? Well, he said from the wise and the prudent. Now who are the wise and the prudent? Are they the learned? the educated, the knowledgeable? No, not necessarily. Uh, this is nothing against education, nothing against being well informed. What would we do without education, without information, without learning? My, if I lived a thousand years, I'd love to study all kinds of subjects. Botany, chemistry, anything. I'm interested in everything. But that isn't what the Lord talks about. Well, who are the wise and the prudent? They are what we would normally call the smart Alexis. <laughs> now, there are none of those in Virginia, but they are in Pennsylvania. Shall we say the snobs? Those with their nose up in the air, uh, the know-it-alls, the unteachable, right. those you can't tell anything, they know everything better. Right. They think so much, they, they think they know so much. Mm -hmm. You know why they think they know so much? Because they don't know enough to know that they don't know everything. <laughs> And so they think they know an awful lot. In fact, the more we increase our knowledge, the more we increase our awareness of how little we know. If you throw a circle and the inside of the circle represents your knowledge and the circle beyond the, the uh, things we're not informed about, increase your knowledge and you also increase the awareness of what you don't know. That's why Einstein could say, we know nothing. That man knew so much that he knew that what he did know was so little in comparison to what there is to know that he called it nothing. But there are people, they are so ignorant that they don't even know that they don't know everything. So, they're the snobs and can tell me. Well, then who are, who are the babes? You see, thou hast hit these things 
from the smart Alexis. And Jesus said, I thank thee, Father. <laughs> and I do the same. <laughs> thank you, Father, for not giving to the smart Alexis some of these choice things of the presence of God. You know why? They tremble all over it. Right. They tremble all over it. So God said, no, I won't let you spoil it. Uh -uh. I'll give it to the babes. But who are the babes? Well, the babes are the simple, the humble, the lowly, the hungry, the open. Do you know what? Uh, you read in John hmm, 6, I think. No man can, 640 something. No man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. You know what is my personal strong belief? That in fallen human nature, there is no desire for God because of sin. And whenever a person feels drawn God, but has an interest in God, I believe that is the activity of the Spirit of God. And if God gives us a hunger, oh, I want more of God. I want to know him. Oh, I'm hungry after reality. As far as I'm concerned, that is a hunger, you might call it desire or thirst, produced by the Spirit of God, because that for which we hunger is capable of being attained. The very hunger for more of God we have is not only the God's call to get us to move in that direction, but it is also the guarantee that that for which we hunger can be found in God and will be attained if we keep following in the direction of the hunger. Yeah. Could you understand that? Yeah. And has revealed among the babes. Now I don't remember when I was a babe. I can't think that far back. But I've seen other babes. They get hungry. Well now, when a baby is hungry, it manifests its hunger. Ah! No, oh, brother, you got to go and do something. All right, small baby, the mother feeds it. That doesn't thing doesn't say, "Hey, mom, wait a minute." Before I drink this white stuff, I want a chemical analysis. <laughs> <laughs> I want to complete analysis of what's water, what's what else <laughs> No. It has a hunger. And the mother feeds it and doesn't ask questions, goes to work. There is something there that corresponds to that hunger. Now you give it mustard. Well, uh, it doesn't have the, the, the appetite of something that to which mustard would appeal. So it is in this area. Now, you cannot press this too far or you get lost. We just take this little area. Illustrations cannot always be pressed or applied in all aspects. Uh, it just doesn't fit. But so it is with God. God gives you a hunger. You may not even know what you are hungry for. Except you know, oh, it's God. I want something from God. You have a sense of need. A preacher comes along and brings truth that you have never heard, maybe do not fully understand, and in here it's like a baby. You eat, you drink, and you say, that's it. Mmm, that's it. Mmm, mmm, that's it. Mm. How do you know that's it? Oh, I feel it in my soul. 
Well, that's just the work of the Spirit, God's presence within you, giving you a hunger and with it a recognition to recognize that this is it. Even though before you could not have defined it, you could not have explained it, you didn't know it yourself, when it comes within your reach, that's it. Well, how do you know? I just know. Well, how do you just know? I don't know how I just know, but that's it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that's the base. Now, I would think that in a group like this, I don't see how anybody here would be a snob. It seems to me in a group like this, you, you'd, have, you'd have all babes. I hope you're not insulted when you don't say, well, that man called us a baby, I resent that. <laughs> well, only children get into the kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't see how anybody would be here that weren't really in this category. So, God withholds something. Do you know, folks, folks, in some groups where I minister, I no longer share these things, I teach still. I teach things, these things all over the world every year, and other things too. But in certain groups, I've become silent for years. Why? They have become such... No. <laughs> But I pick up my little bread basket from the Lord and go overseas and teach it. Oh, you know, when conceit, carnal thinking gets into the heart, oh, it ruins people for this kind of thing. All right, now let's see what else I have here on the menu. Uh, Psalm 25, 14, our nearly. <laughs> Did I do something wrong? <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, never mind. <laughs> I merely touched on Psalm 25, 14. Uh, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. God shares some of his secrets with some of his people. Not with others. Folks, God does not share everything with everybody. Right. It depends. You tell certain secrets to your friends only. And I think the older you get, the less secrets you tell because you've learned. <laughs> <laughs> and God is very judicious. But he shares secrets. He lets some of his people in on some of his things. Do you, do you remember Abraham? God said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to go down and destroy the city. Shall I not tell my friend Abraham the thing that I do? Incidentally, well, perhaps we'll get back to this later. I think when the Lord appeared to Abraham in Genesis 18, there were three men. I personally believe the three men were the Trinity, but I won't argue the point. I'm only stating what I believe. And the Lord said, I'm going to go down, destroy the city. Shall I not tell Abraham, seeing he's my friend? God said, hey, I got a friend over there. I can destroy these cities within, without letting him in on the secret. In the Lord. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. I was speaking to about 18 French ministers one year down in the Pyrenees Mountains in an old castle where the little seminar. And I used that verse and one said, do you know how it reads in the French Bible? No, but I was interested. And there it reads, uh, oh, the intimate communion of the Lord is with them that fear him. Now I like both renderings. They're both delicious. The intimate communion of the Lord 
is with them that fear him. Now, talking about the fear of God would take a whole study itself. We can indulge in that. But there is a sharing of secrets, an intimate communion with, cert with certain of his people that qualify for it. And we'll get to those qualifications just a, a little bit later. So there, um, our attainment of an intimate knowledge of God involves a right relationship. Now in Matthew 11, we simply have to boil it down without boiling it up, a right attitude. Psalm 25, 14, a right relationship. We have seven minutes to go. All right. Second Chronicles 30. I can go past both, can't I? Second Chronicles 30, 22. You find a reference to some teaching the good knowledge of the Lord. There is much needing, need among God's people today to teach the good knowledge of the Lord, and this includes teaching on the personal knowledge of God. In Ephesians 1, 15, 18, you have the, the activity of the Holy Spirit. Paul praying that he might give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that ye might know. Many of these things cannot be comprehended without the activity of the Spirit of God enabling us to see. Uh, I want to take you for a moment to Proverbs 2, 1 to 5. Uh, let's see, I better turn to that. I'm now hurrying a little bit because I see that my time is uh, overall. Uh, Proverbs 2, 1 to 5, but I'm only going to use verse 4 at the same time. And what you have here is, it involves, that is this knowledge of God, involves an esteem of the knowledge of God. For instance, in verse 4, if thou seekest... The knowledge of good. In verse 4, if thou seekest her as silver, searchest for her as for a hidden treasure. You see here, the knowledge of God is likened to silver being in the ground, yet in a vein, unrecovered. It also likens it to a a treasure that is hidden. Friends, some of the choicest things of God do not lie on the surface. You can't just pick them up like this, like a count from a counter in the five and time. But why not? Because these things are not for the half-hearted, the lukewarm, the indifferent, they are for people who have an appreciation yes. for these things and who demonstrate their appreciation by doing some digging and some searching who go after it with an effort. They are not for the casual. They are for the earnest. So this silver of the knowledge of God is still hidden in the ground in the vein. You got to go for it. It is hidden in the ground like a a hidden hidden treasure. God does not make things so easy for us. Not in this area. 
Have you ever noticed that God in his ways causes you to run an obstacle course? Some things are not obtainable without succeeding in an obstacle course. For instance, have you noticed in Exodus where Moses put the tabernacle, now that's not the regular tabernacle, but the temporary tent he had there. I think you find that if I err not, oh, where would that be? That would be, I suppose, in Exodus 34, I believe. I can find it for you if need be for another service. We, we are told that he put the tabernacle afar off Oh, I would like to find that. Let's see. Gives me a little rest, too, because I find now that I'm wearing out. Uh, I'm using a different Bible here, and I'm not sure that I can just locate it like that. Pardon? 337? 33.7. Oh, you are right. Good for you. It's 33. Thank you. Oh, that's nice. Hmm? <laughs> Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without a camp afar off from the camp. Well, why afar off? And, uh, and uh, it says, it came to pass that everyone which saw the Lord went out. Now, why didn't Moses put the tabernacle right next to the camp where people could just slip out in their uh, night clothes almost and move over there conveniently? Now, Moses put it out of the way, afar off, it was an obstacle course because the people who really sought God did not mind going afar off to the presence of God to the tabernacle. This was, in fact, a way of, oh, what word shall I, of separating the wheat from the chaff, the earnest from the indifferent. So God put it off in the distance where the people had to make a real effort to get there because God wanted, shall I say, a select group. He didn't want the drifters who say, well, I got to walk for a whole mile. I ain't gonna walk. It looks like we might get some rain. No, no. Those who wanted God, never mind the rain, even God has a way of separating people. Praise you know, I had a godly pastor, Swift, and that man knew. We had an order service on Sunday night, and so oh, there were lots of people. He'd sit on the platform, just wait on the Lord. He didn't bother going around the order working at all. And after a while, people left, another, another, a carload, another. In an hour or so, there'd be a handful, comparatively speaking. I said, and then he'd get up and, well, now, sister, can I do something for you? Uh, can I help you? And I said, Brother Swift, tell me something. When the order is full, you just go up there and sit. And then when most of the people have left, after 15 minutes, half an hour, you start praying for people. I said, how is that? Brother Butler, he said, I'm just waiting for the driftwood to go home. <laughs> he had something for the driftwood to go home. He divided them. He knew the real earnest would stay. And so God has a way of not only testing our earnestness, but he assesses us from the effort we are willing to make if a person has to go a long distance to get, let's say, to the tabernacle. God knows they mean business. God wants, and this is terrible to say, this is one of the unpardonable things. God has a select group 
with whom he wishes to share the secrets of his presence, so he puts an obstacle in between to be sure that most likely he'll get only those that have to make a real effort, sometimes at considerable expense and inconvenience, to get where God can manifest his presence. And while we are here, I saw something the other day. Uh, let me see now. Uh, that must be here too. See, I'm using a small Bible and I have a little difficulty. Without. End of the tap on your. I'll find it. No, I'm, I'm not sure now. There is a statement somewhere in this area. This must be the place. Well, anyhow, uh, it's, it's there. Moses went out to the tabernacle with Joshua. Can you see that? Uh, do you use a stone yeah. Bible? You have it? That Moses went out with his servant Joshua. Seven verse. Eleventh verse. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good. Why I have helped us say that's wonderful. Yeah. And <laughs> and he turned again into the camp. Moses came back, but his servant Joshua, a young man departed not out of the tabernacle. How come? Now here is something I wish I'm wearing a well I'll push a little bit yet, okay? Uh, I wish the Lord would open up to me. This young man departed not out of the tabernacle. Now what is sure here is Joshua lingered in the Lord's presence. He lingered. Now why would he linger? I don't know. But he must have somehow had a, have an attachment for the presence of God. He lingered in his presence. I didn't say loitered. There's a difference between loitering and marking time and lingering and this young man who was so earnest that he lingered in God's presence when Moses had left he became the leader of God's people I believe there is a relationship somewhere between Joshua's lingering in God's presence, which demonstrate, demonstrates a certain attitude and appreciation of that presence. I believe that lingering was a factor in God's choice of that man for the leadership of his people. The loit, not the loiterers, the lingerers in his presence are up to get from God what those in a hurry to leave don't get. Hallelujah. And Mary at the grave of Jesus was another one. 